Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, the Winter Olympics are now over. Although the closing ceremony won't be shown on television here until this evening, because South Korea is, I think, 15 hours ahead of us, the ceremony actually began at 5 o'clock this morning, our time. And so all the medals have been awarded, the Olympic flame has been extinguished, and these games will soon fade away and become a distant memory in the lives of most of us. Now that's not true, of course, for the Olympic athletes and their families. Most of these athletes have devoted their lives to participating in the Olympics, and so they won't ever forget about these games. I think about the figure skaters, for example. From the time they were small children, they were on the ice, skating for hours a day, year after year after year, trying to achieve perfection in their sport. Their goal was ultimately to win a gold medal and achieve skating immortality, as it were. Now, admittedly, I never participated very intensely in sports. And so the sacrifice that people make to become an Olympic athlete is a bit foreign and even perplexing to me. Again, take figure skating. After all the years of sacrifice and preparation, it finally comes down to a few minutes on the ice in the Olympic arena. One fall on the ice, even just one minor mistake, and their dream of being an Olympic champion will be over. And even for those who execute their performance flawlessly, it won't be flawless to the judges, who are ready to dock them points for even the smallest of errors, errors that are undetectable to the average person watching at home. But it has to be this way, for only one person can win the Olympic gold. Sadly, and it seems harsh for me to say this, but everyone else will go home a loser. Even the silver and bronze medals are reminders of one's defeat. While those who earn these medals can rightfully be proud of their second and third place finishes, they'll also forever wonder what more they could have done to have stood on the top of the podium. And what about those few who do win the gold, who receive that coveted gold medal? What happens to them? Well, they'll remember their achievement, of course, for as long as they live. So, too, will their immediate family, as well as those who are extremely devoted fans of their sport. But for the rest of us, the other 99.9% .9 of the world's population, most of these gold medal winners will soon fade away from our memory and be forgotten. For example, do any of you know or remember who won the gold medal for ladies figure skating at the 2014 Winter Olympics in Sochi, Russia? I didn't. I had to look it up. It was, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing her name right, but it was Adelina Sotnikova of Russia. Now, perhaps I didn't remember her because just four years later, at the ripe old age of 21, it appears her skating career is over. She didn't compete in this year's Olympics, failing to qualify for the Games. Now, Olympic figure skating is beautiful. There's no doubt about that. And I'm grateful for those who grace the ice with this beautiful display of skill. But I also wonder why these athletes and their families do it. Why are they so devoted to the Olympics? 
Why do they sacrifice so much in pursuit of winning a gold medal, which so few will achieve, and even for those who do, so very few others will even remember? As I said, it all seems a bit foreign and perplexing to me. But then again, I think we can learn from their example of sacrifice and devotion to their sport, even if I think their devotion may be a bit misplaced. For example, in 1 Corinthians, St. Paul writes, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath or prize, but we an imperishable one. The imperishable wreath or prize we seek is the crown of life, which Jesus promises to all who believe in him. Jesus said, be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. And so as his disciples, Jesus calls us to be faithful to him. He calls us to a life of unceasing devotion to him, a life in which we set our minds not on the things of man, but on the things of God. And Jesus couldn't be any clearer about this. He says in today's Gospel reading, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. To take up one's cross simply means to suffer and sacrifice. Just as Jesus took up his cross and was sacrificed upon it. Jesus had just told his disciples that he'd have to suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed. And now he warns them that they too will suffer for his sake and for the sake of the gospel. The good news of salvation that Jesus had come to give to the world by giving his life for the sins of the world. Now we know Olympic athletes sacrifice so much to win a gold medal. But what about Jesus? What would make Jesus willing to suffer so terribly for us? We might wonder. Because when you think about the crucifixion of Jesus, it's hard to stomach. Even our bulletin cover this morning is hard to look at as we see the drops of blood on the crown of thorns and the stream of blood on the wood of the cross. Well, as we know, quite simply, Jesus suffered and died for us because he loves us. He was devoted not to himself, but to us. He sacrificed everything he had, even his own life, so that we might be his forever. Though our sins would have condemned us to spend eternity apart from him, Jesus paid the penalty on our behalf so that his blood now cleanses us from all our sin. St. Paul says it so beautifully in today's epistle reading. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Yes, the crucifixion of Jesus was unimaginably brutal. Can you even fathom the devotion Jesus had for us that compelled him to stay on the cross when he could have come down at any time and stop the excruciating pain. But we also know that as awful as the cross was, it wasn't the end for Jesus. 
Jesus told his disciples that he'd have to suffer and die, but he also told them that after three days, he would rise again. And of course, he did. St. Paul speaks about this too. He writes, Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we are reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more now that we are reconciled shall we be saved by his life. And more than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. My friends, because of the death and resurrection of Jesus, we have been reconciled to God. God is with us, and we are with God. We are not alone. Jesus, who is God, the second person of the Holy Trinity, walks with us through the trials and tribulations of this world. He blazes the trail before us. He bids us to follow him because he is Emmanuel, God with us. Where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them, Jesus says. And behold, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. Yes, Jesus is with us in his word, in his sacraments, in his church, where he strengthens us to bear our cross and to follow him. Again, Jesus says, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And so it's not easy being a Christian, just as it's not easy being an Olympic figure skater. It requires suffering, sacrifice, dedication, and devotion. It requires bearing your cross just as Jesus bore his. Martin Luther writes, if you would be a Christian and a child of God, you must also bear what in consequence happens to you. In a word, a Christian, just because he is a Christian, is subjected to the dear Holy Cross so that he must suffer either at the hands of men or from the devil himself, who plagues and terrifies him with tribulation, persecution, poverty, and sickness, or within in the heart with his poisonous darts. The cross is the Christian sign and watchword in the holy, precious, noble, and blessed calling which is taking him to heaven. To this calling we must do justice and we must accept as good whatever it brings. My friends, we can accept as good the sufferings we endure as a Christian because we know, as St. Paul says, that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, hope that will not put us to shame because it is the certain hope of everlasting life in heaven. Yes, my friends, at the end of our earthly journey, we will receive not an Olympic medal that few will ever remember, but we will receive the crown of life, won for us by Jesus himself. And what's more, we will always be remembered because Jesus has engraved our names in the palms of his nail-scarred hands. Amen.